Well, good evening. Glad to have all of those of you that are here. Glad to have those of you that are following us by Facebook. And we have a special night tonight. Uh, we're happy to have with us Brad and Beth Huddleston. And tonight, a lot of what's going to be talked about falls under the categories of critical race theory and also critical gender theory. Uh, that most people are more familiar with it, just transgender gender issues. But it does fall under the heading of critical gender theory. But we do this, Ecclesia Principles, every Tuesday night here. It's also on Facebook, our, our church Facebook, Victory Worship Center. And we have some information I'll tell you about at the end. But I do want to start out on this. We largely do not understand what Ecclesia is supposed to mean. Uh, if your only source for understanding Ecclesia is a Bible dictionary, you won't understand what Ecclesia is supposed to be. The word Ecclesia is a compound word. It means called out. Most Christians just know it from that vantage point. But when Jesus used it roughly about 2,000 years ago, the only place that Ecclesia was used at that time was in Greek and Roman society. And what the called out stood for, it was the citizens who were called out to vote on civil policy and determine the culture of their area. And when Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my ecclesia, that's what he was talking about. But we've been sold a bill of goods that you're supposed to keep religion and politics separate. So nothing's been resisting the gates of hell. Just, you know, I'm not very deep, but I've never seen gates walking down the street. It's the church. <laughs> it's the church that is supposed to be moving against the gates. We're not supposed to be stationary. We're not supposed to be contained within the walls. We are called out to make a difference in the culture of our world. We're to preach the gospel, get people saved. And, and I'm going to be as quick as I can, but that's hard for me. Uh, <laughs> But when Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations, we think about making disciples of individuals. Jesus didn't say disciple individuals. He said to disciple nations. That's a collection of people. We're supposed to teach them to observe. Not all of them is going to get saved, but the ones that do, we'll baptize. Others, we still need to get the principles of Christianity into government. That's our responsibility as the Ecclesia. We're called out for that purpose. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And my last thing before I turn it over to Brad. <laughs> for years it bothered me. I looked at the Great Awakenings. And one of the things I thought, well, they just missed it. Because in both great awakenings that our nation has had, and I think we're in need of a third. In the two first great awakenings, the church dealt with politics. We haven't dealt with politics since the second great awakening. And what has it gotten us? The third great awakening I firmly believe will have to come under the same principle, principles that the first one did. When we decide that Jesus is Lord over all of our lives, including politics, and we actually work to disciple the nation on what he says things should be, then we will begin to have a revival. We will have a great awakening that will actually change the fabric of our nation. 
not just people getting saved. Thank God for getting saved and going to heaven. But we also need a change in our society. And that will not come by a pure, just straight up revival. It has to be an awakening where it changes the fabric of how people think and how they approach life. To do that, politics, government, is all about how life is lived within a nation. And the church has removed itself from politics and from government, so we have no influence on how life is lived in the nation. We got to change it. We got to be different. We need the, our nation needs it. Having said all of that, because I could go on forever, but we're happy to have Brad and Beth with us. Uh, Brad brings a, an extensive knowledge of. He, he conducts um, conferences for schools, speakers at that. Uh, Renew a Nation. He has a magazine out there with that. That he's a writer for that. It's about bringing uh, the biblical worldview into schools and into society. And he, he travels the world when COVID lets him. And so it's starting back up, thank God. But it's good to have him here. And I just want to give you a disclaimer. We are doing it unedited, correct? Okay. I'll just say this for those of you on Facebook. Uh, I have a website that we put all our political stuff on. It's called Ray Eppert on Politics. No use hiding it. That's what we're talking about. We don't think Facebook will shut us down. But if it does, this will still be recorded and it will be posted on rayeppertonpolitics.com sometime tomorrow. So that you can still get everything there. But some of what you're going to hear tonight is graphic. Uh, Brad is actually going to be on my radio program um, this coming Sunday. Uh, we're recording this week. He will be on. We're on ESPN 1240 on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. He'll be on there. We'll be talking some more about some of this. We cannot air it unedited on radio. And when I say that, that's because some of the text of books that are approved for our school system are being read. To me, that tells you all you need to know. If the words of those books can't be read on radio, they ought not be authorized for school. And so let's give Brad a very warm welcome. Thank you, Pastor Ray. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you. I can't tell well, you know, speakers are supposed to say I'm honored to be here. I actually mean it. My friendship with Pastor Ray has just grown and grown and grown. And um, there have been times, I don't know if those of you who had the privilege of having lunch with him or coffee or sitting under his preaching, aren't there times that the, the anointing comes on him and this revelation or wisdom tailor-made for you just oozes off of him? Have you noticed that? So I have coffee with him every chance I get. Because <laughs> it's awesome, Pastor Ray. Love you. Um, it's going to get pretty, as Pastor Ray alluded to, pretty heavy in here. Uh, someone famous once said, make them laugh or they will kill you. So I'm going to attempt to make you laugh first. <laughs> Whenever I get too, I don't know, I'm intense because, you know, I'm passionate about what I believe in, and I should be, but when I get a little over the edge, sometimes I think, I think I have no theological basis for this. But I think God trips me up and giggles at me. That's just an opinion. I could be wrong. But... One such moment, Beth and I went to uh, a buffet. I call them the hog trough. <laughs> um, but it was a pizza buffet, and we were standing there, and, and I'm, for some reason, I'm fine when I drive, I have patience, but when it comes to standing in lines, oh, I just have to pray to not sin. And as we were standing there waiting on people, and I'm, you know, they're so slow picking around the food, and I'm sitting there thinking things like, would you hurry up? Now, I didn't say it, but I'm thinking, like, don't take that piece. That's the one I wanted. <laughs> and while I was standing there in my impatience and my boredom, I reached over and I grabbed her and I'm hugging her and I'm rubbing her neck and giving her a back rub. And when I looked, it wasn't Beth. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, ah! <laughs> 
It's a sweet little lady. And I said, ma'am, I am so sorry. I was not sexually harassing you. <laughs> she looked at me. She goes, it's okay, honey. I was enjoying it. <laughs> and I imagine the Lord's going, <laughs> that's my boy. Well, for those of you that I haven't had the privilege of meeting, uh, this is Beth. You'll meet her around here. She's at the table out there. She'll be roaming around with a camera taking pictures of you if you're on your phone while I'm speaking, and we will put you on the Internet. Anyway, uh, I'm an author and a researcher, and this is my latest book. It's called Digital Cocaine. I'm not going to talk very much at all about this tonight, although there's some relationship there. But what I actually do, I'm an ordained minister. I'm ordained as an evangelist, but I also have a a computer science degree, and what I've been studying in the last number of years uh, is neuroscience. And so I've been asked to go into collaboration in, in a number, with a number of organizations, but one is at the Bureau of Market Research in the Neuroscience uh, Division at the University of South Africa. So they're very much on the cutting edge there of trying to keep the technology up because re revival rolls across Africa, if you've ever been. Well, since the phones have come, guess where the attention's gone? Not on Jesus anymore. So those are some of the colleagues that I work there. So I'm very privileged to preach around the world in various churches, big and very small. And um, I, I love education, so I'm, that's a big part of my life, both in Christian schools, public schools, and home schools. This was the first global homeschool conference in Manila. Spend quite a bit of time also in Australia working with law enforcement. And what we do is extensive school tours. And we do qualitative and quantitative research to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening globally with TikTok and Instagram and all that sort of stuff. So this type of research is figuring out what's going on and what they're actually doing. And then I'll take trends back to the laboratory and propose projects. And then the people who are really smart will do them. <laughs> so that's what I've been asked to do. And I end up in a lot of places it might surprise you. Um, and I don't go there because I represent... Allah, I represent the Lord Jesus Christ because there's no other name under heaven by which a man or a woman is saved except by the name of Jesus Christ. Some of you may know me from the radio. I'm still doing quite a bit of radio. I'm on about 720 stations across Australia. It's a Christian network, but I do a lot of secular. This is the ABC, which is the Australian version, um, and radio and television talking about all this sort of stuff. Um, and I do that to represent the Lord even in those secular environments. But I do want to read a passage of Scripture here because I think we're all burdened for our students. Amen? Amen. We're burdened. You're burdened for your kids, your grandkids. Uh, I'm very much burdened for them. And this is what Jesus had to say related to children. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Now, those are the words of Jesus. That's... Amen? Amen. You don't hear these sort of things uh, read too much anymore, but... Uh, just because they're not red doesn't mean Jesus took them away. It means we have. And what's happening is children are being caused to stumble through critical race theory, critical theory, critical gender theory, LGBTQ, etc. Amen? That's what's happening. And the church is late to the game. But we're here, and with God, all things are possible. Well, let's look at secular humanism. We've sort of graduated. Secular humanism has ruled the day for the past 60, 70 years, and now we've transitioned into full-blown Marxism, but humanism is still there as well. And this journey with humanism marching through our public, or now what a lot of people are calling our government school systems, has been going on for quite some time. This is a quote from 1930, actually, from Charles Potter, from the, the Humanism uh, uh, magazine. He says, secular humanism is an attempt to function as a civilized society with the exclusion of God and his moral principles. During the last several decades, humanists have been very successful in propagating their beliefs. Their primary approach is to target the youth through the public school system. Humanist Charles F. Potter writes, education is thus a most powerful ally of humanism, and every American school is a school of humanism. Sorry, I, I didn't eat before I came in. That's my stomach. <laughs> What can a theistic Sunday school's meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching? You see how bold they've been? They put this out there back in 1930 and said, we're going to do this, and they have. John Dumphy said this, I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselytizers of a new faith 
a religion of humanity. These teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalist preachers. For they will be ministers of another sort, utilizing a classroom instead of a pulpit to convey humanist values in whatever subject they teach, regardless of the educational level, preschool, daycare, or large state university. And they've been right out there with their agenda. You have to give it to Marxists and humanists and Muslims. They will tell you exactly what they're going to do. And for some reason, we fail to believe them. And we don't mount up a proper standard against it. So this critical race theory is really going to be the foundation, as Pastor Ray said, of what we're going to talk about tonight. So we've had humanism, secular humanism, going through the public school system for decades, still there. And now on top of that, we have Marxism. Our country is experiencing a full-on Marxist revolution right now. And in history, the Marxists have killed a about a hundred million people throughout their march around the globe. The white supremacists, the Nazis more specifically, about 25 million. So they're both evil to their core. But if you were to say one is worse than the other, you would have to say Marxism is a lot more lethal. I was in Charlottesville on August 12, 2017. I was on my way to uh, catch a, well, I had to catch a flight the next day, I think it was, or the day after somewhere, I think Australia or somewhere, and I was going to Charlottesville to shop. And as I was going over the mountain, Afton Mountain, a buddy of mine that works at NBC, because I've worked in media, he said, hey, can you come over here and help me? He said, they've got me out in the street running a camera, and, and they're starting to fight. It's getting really dangerous. And I could tell he was scared, and I heard that small, still voice of the Lord say, go be with your friend. And I'm thinking, do I tell Beth or just do it and ask for forgiveness later? So I chose to call her and be honest. And uh, she, she probably knew I was going anyway, but I went down there and I walked through the tear gas. They were fighting and it was just absolute chaos. I took photos. And so what I was doing, my buddy was running the, the drone and I was helping him run the drone. And so we would offload the footage in the studio over there at NBC. They would upload it for the news. And then we'd run back out there in the midst of all this chaos, get more footage and back and forth. So I took my own photographs, but I want you to see some of the things that were happening in 2017. And I don't think people were aware of just the communist nature that was going on. Do you see the hammer and sickle on their flag here? Do you see the word diversity in the rainbow color? You know what those represent, don't you? That's LGBTQ. It's militant LGBTQ. And so as the fighting was going on, the white supremacists on one side, the Marxists on the other, the militia, you know, it was the militia that saved the day because the cops got called off. And the militia stood there. Nobody would go near them. And they meant business. So I was taking photographs. You can see the satellite trucks and so forth uh, where I was helping out. But uh, you, you can just see their communist flags. They're right open. And they're violent. And other telltale signs that we're under a Marxist revolution. A lot of these are students, by the way. College students doing this. Students. They've been militarized in our university system, as was promised. So you got jobs, not racism. There's the term racism. Everything's racism now. But right here, Workers World Party. Workers of the World Unite. That's Karl Marx. And they're very open about it. And the thing that baffled me, I went home, and I was pretty shaken up that day at what I saw. Not, not that I was ever in any danger. I mean, the weird thing was, I was in the middle of all the danger, but it was as though the Holy Spirit just had this bubble around me. And everywhere I went, it was as though nobody even saw me. And I was right in the middle of them. And I was not afraid until later. <laughs> at the time, I was like... I just kept hearing the Lord saying, now just pay attention. I'm teaching you things here. Just pay attention. And, and I would engage some of these left-wingers in conversation, calm conversation, and I would just listen. Just listen. Don't engage them. Don't argue. Just listen. And that's how I learned. We weren't going to change each other's mind that day. And if you tried changing theirs, they'd take a club and hit you. Amen. So I came home and... Pastor Ray, it was like when you get a sermon and, and until you get it down on paper or however you transmit your sermons, mine tends to be PowerPoint, until you write this stuff out, that burden won't lift. And I heard the Lord say, write an article about what you saw today. And I'm like, I've got to get on a plane 
and writing gives me a migraine headache. But I, I mean, I, I do it and I like it, but it's stressful for me. To, have you ever written a book? It's like one long two-year headache. I mean, it's, but it's, it's wonderful. But even articles are just like, ugh. But I couldn't, so I wrote this article and it went viral. And the only thing I want to say about this, this is the eye-opener for me in 2017 of really what I'm going to talk about tonight, the blindness that people have. And I'm not saying you're blind, you're here. I'm just saying in general, President Trump, love him or hate him, he, he went to the podium when he did the press conference and he said this phrase, there was evil on both sides. And the press, even Fox News, went berserk. And I was honestly, honestly, I'm like, what I miss? Because I was there, I was in Charlottesville. On this side, there was evil, and on this side, there was evil. And then they said moral equivalency, meaning you cannot equate what the left-wingers, the Marxists, were doing because they're opposed to white supremacy. So any ideology that opposes white supremacy is valid now, and white supremacy is not. So you have to give a pass to anything that opposes it. And I'm thinking, you don't understand Marxism. And the press, these, these young reporters clearly didn't know about the 100 million people that have died as a result of this ideology. And the point I'm trying to make is it's in our schools deeply entrenched. It's even in Christian schools. Uh, I'll be doing a tour with Liberty University with their, it the, was the Falkirk Center. Pastor, I can you think of the new name of it? Standing for Freedom or, yes, yeah, Standing Courageous or something. They changed the name of it because a bunch of students were opposed to it, but it didn't do any good. The students are still opposed to it because it's the political arm. So they've got me doing a, a, a talk in Virginia Beach and Norfolk and then up in the D.C. area next month. And I got a call today. They may extend it into August talking about these things. But then I get this other message today from a, a dad who took his son down to Liberty to let him look over the university. He's considering going to school there. And the Equity and Diversity Department gave him a lecture. And his dad said, you're not going to believe this. This place has got Marxism in it now. And I looked it up on the web, and sure enough, they got all the buzzwords. So there's, it's not, I don't want to write off Liberty University. I'm not, because I'm going to do the tour with them. But I'm just saying everybody's divided on this issue. Churches are divided on Schools are divided on And so we hope to enlighten you on what's actually going on. Back in the 1920s, 1923 to be exact, there was a group of intellectuals, most of them were Jewish. Now, they weren't Orthodox Jews as we know it today, but they were Marxists. And Karl Marx had failed to get the bourgeoisie or the middle class to take up their arms and unite and fight because they wanted to destroy uh, capitalism and all this sort of stuff and make everything, redistribute the wealth and make everybody uh, socialist. And, and it didn't work. And so these intellectuals formed a school in Germany called the Frankfurt School. And they came up with a plan over time on how they were going to get this message of Marxism into the culture because obviously people weren't willing to die over it and take up arms. So what they said is, we're gonna sort of change some terms here, which we now know as political correctness, as opposed to uh, cultural Marxism. It's still called that in some places, but they changed the name to political correctness. They borrowed it from the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union had already used some of these tactics to spread the message of Marxism. And so they said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna march through the West through their institutions. And what we're gonna have to do though is tear down the one barrier that is keeping socialism from taking hold in the West. And that's this thing called the Judeo-Christian ethic. There's too many Christians. And that is deeply entrenched in these countries. America was founded by Christians and now it's all throughout their constitution is based on all this. So we have to chip away. And so the Frankfurt School of Marxism came up with a plan and then they got thrown out of Germany. Hitler threw them out. And guess who took them in? Columbia University in New York City. And a lot of the Marxist professors came on staff and then many of them spread throughout our university system and they started educating young people who would ultimately become teachers in the public school system. Am I making sense to you? And now what we are seeing is the culmination of that promise all the way back from 1923, two generations, three generations later. They're fully entrenched. 
So that's a little bit of the history of how it has spread. And I remember about eight years ago, I was teaching at Blue Ridge uh, Community College, and we, we had a conference there, and there's some staff members there and some, uh, some students, and I was tasked with a lecture on where did political correctness come from? I mean, it had to come from somewhere. And I gave that talk a little bit more in depth than what I just gave you, and they looked at me like I was a conspiracy theorist. Now it's all in the news. Nobody's shocked that it's Marxism because everybody's talking about it now. But what I'm trying to say is that this goes back a long way. But thankfully, finally, there's been some pushback. So have a look at this. Fairfax County public school teacher, and I'm going to give a message of encouragement to parents and teachers and students who are too afraid to come and speak forward. Parents, the longer that you wait and you don't hold your child's schools accountable gives these guys more time to dictate what's best for your child's physical, mental, and emotional health. Don't be afraid to speak out for your kids because they are voiceless and they, and they rely on you. You should be afraid of them rooting for socialism by the time they get to middle school. Teachers, it may seem that our careers have come to a dead end, but I'm here to remind you, we don't work for the school board. We work to mold the next generation of well-rounded American patriots. So don't give up because it is up to us. Students, you are on the front lines of these indoctrination camps. Challenge the staff when you're presented with a ludicrous statement and do not allow anybody to tell you that you cannot accomplish anything because of your skin color or to hate yourself because of your skin color. Students, it is up to you to be the next generation of victims or victors. And finally, to the board, this isn't over and your policies are just as pathetic as making us wear masks. Nick Gossard, followed by Ryan. They cut her mic. In case you don't know, that's going on all over the country, thank the Lord. That happens to be in Loudoun County, in the Fairfax area. And that was a teacher. Now, you realize what she did? And so in a little while, when I, a few minutes when I get to the part where we say, so what do we do about it? Well, that's what you, you pray first. Because if we don't win this in the spirit realm first, we're going to lose out here in the natural. Amen. So we fast and pray, but then you do that. And you push back. You push back. I've tried so hard to find out what's going on on the local scene. In Rockingham County, there's rumors, and so I, I'm not going to spread rumors, so I'm only going to say this one time, so you better listen closely. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, that, <laughs> I, I, I really don't know what's going on. I, I have people who have been asking. I, I have friends who's... Uh, Spouses teach in the schools, and there's just rumors. And, we're, and to be honest with you, when it comes to Augusta County, when it comes to Rockingham, I do know from, from Nelson that it, as of this next school year, they're saying that it's coming, but not this school year. That's all I've, I've found out. And I've heard all kinds of things, but we're really not going to know until we show up at school board meetings and ask questions and then monitor the curriculum that the children bring home. So that's what you do about it. And then we aggregate that between groups like ours, with city elders and Pastor Ray, myself, and we'll get together, and then we get that information out. The only place, I've, only thing I've been able to, to, to find is about Albemarle County. In 2019, the Albemarle County Virginia School Board unanimously voted to adopt a radical anti-racism policy aimed at building the racial consciousness by requiring children to deconstruct their racial and sexual identities. And understand that anti-racism is an action. Now, you're not surprised at Albemarle County, but it is close to us, for which they have a personal responsibility. Breitbart News has obtained access to the county's pilot curriculum, which the county has attempted to keep secret from parents. You may remember when President Trump was president, he formed the 1776 Commission to put history back in its proper place and teach patriotism through the federally go government mandated curricula throughout the schools. And then as soon as Biden stole the election, can I say that here? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because the exit's over there. I was brave of me, wasn't I? Uh, no, I figured I was in good company here. But when Biden became the alleged president, you know what he did on the first day? He dismantled the 1776 Commission, there went all the curricula that Hills, Hillsdale College was uh, 
involved in and everything, and they immediately put back into place the 1619 Project. If you've not heard of that, here's a little bit about it. The school curriculum link to the New York Times 1619 Project. New York Times ought to be a clue right there as to what's going on here. An initiative that aims to reframe U.S. history by putting the legacy of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at its center is once and again the target of Republican lawmakers who seek to ban the materials in three states. Now that's a very biased way of explaining what that's all about. Basically, nobody is going to uh, squabble over how horrible slavery is. But what they won't tell you is, is that we were the first, uh, one of the first countries through a bloody war to do the right thing and dismantle that sin. In other words, repentance apparently with their side is not allowed. Grace is not part of the picture. If you ever messed up, canceled. That's not how God operates. And I'm so thankful because if that were the case, I would have been canceled numerous times, like most of us in here probably. LGBTQ in Virginia schools. This is so disturbing to me. Everyone is a Virginia learner, and that everyone is in the rainbow color. So right on the Education Department, the Virginia Education Department's website, they're going to tell you what is going to come down and filter into the schools. Now. I want to say this, that one of the things that I hear repeatedly from parents when I do parent meetings and so forth is to say, well, our local public school is safe because there are Christians there. And I'm glad there are Christians there. But do you understand they are not powerful enough to resist Richmond? Are you, and the federal government should something override the, the state? In other words, it's going to be taught one way or the other. And, and if they don't, let's say a teacher does do the right thing, and some will, and push it away, when they get to the next class, it'll just be there, and there's no guarantee that that teacher is going to be a Christian. Because if you remember the quote a few minutes ago, they are committed to teaching these principles regardless of subject. So also on the Department of Education, Virginia, Website. The Virginia Department of Education is committed to working with school divisions to ensure Virginia schools are welcoming, affirming, and safe learning environments for all students. I submit to you all but Christians. So it's disingenuous and it's dishonest. Every Virginia student, regardless of their gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation, has a right to learn free from discrimination and harassment, unless you're discriminating Christians. Now that's unsaid. But you know as well as I do, if you go in there with the Bible and you start quoting Scripture, you're going to be in for quite a bit of harassment. Virginia's Education Equity Framework, Navigating Ed Equity VA, it's a PDF, outlines our commitment to dismantle any and all forms of inequity in Virginia's public education system and includes strategies to support LGBTQ plus students. You might be thinking, aren't we loving and accepting? Well, yes and no. Of course we're loving and we're accepting, but we still disagree with immorality because our worldview is biblical. Now, this is what Pastor was alluding to, and I sincerely want you to know that there's uh, no way in this world I would offend you on purpose. I am not trying to do this just to be shocking. I felt, and I would have, and I did do a, a beeped version for the radio, and I, I did it in video just in case we decided to do that here tonight, because I'm not trying to shock you, but I think if any of you have ever watched movies, you probably won't be shocked at this. Guilty? I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying I wasn't. What I'm shocked at is that they're teaching it to children. That, that's probably the shocking part, okay? But this is some pushback up in Loudoun County where the parents were actually reading the curriculum back to the school board members to get their reaction. Have a look. I came home early from babysitting and see her coming out of some car in these tight ass little shorts, talking fast, telling me she's about to leave me. I grab her by the neck and start punching her. She wanted to be all big and bad, trying to face me like a grown ass woman. She gonna get beat like a grown woman. She started screaming, cursing at me, and carrying on. I threw her in the closet for a couple of days. She kept on screaming, begging to be let out, begging for water. 
Every time she made too much noise, I'd walk in and kick her. Jasper wasn't even my boyfriend, just this dude I did some hacking with once in a while. He was pretty basic library systems, low security shit. Not in my league at all, but he had a big dick, and sometimes a girl just needs a big dick. I tiptoed toward the door, peering through the window at the boy, his pants around his ankles squeezed between April's straddled legs as she lay on top of the teacher's desk. I gripped his arms and flipped him around, pushing him against the wall. His eyes widened, mouth dropping. Hey, what are you doing? He chuckled nervously. I took a deep breath before dropping on my shaky knees, the ground cold. Me and Monday, we did something. We did do something. He took a deep breath. She sucked my dick. I really didn't want it to happen. It just kind of did. Her top lip curled up. Wait a minute. Is that what's really going on? She did your homework and you ate her coochie? Is that why you're crying? Because Monday's not around to do your homework no more. I kept dancing, lost in the music, until some boy pushed me up behind me, holding my hips, and I froze. Looking to Megan for help, she nodded and mouthed, it's okay, it's cool, this is what girls do at parties. I told myself and kept dancing with the boy. I couldn't see the alcohol making my w waist wind faster. Pretty heard a lot of the ladies from my group, they talked about fucking, they talked about dick sucking, they talked about coochie licking. By show of hands, does anyone up here want to talk about that stuff now? Not a single hand, because it's very uncomfortable and we're in a room full of adults. Nobody outside, nobody inside wants to talk about it because they're not acceptable topics. How did we get these un unacceptable topics? Well, one, you didn't follow your procurement policies when you bought $1.8 million worth of these trash books. If you had followed your procurement policies, then you would have done a curriculum review where I hope and pray that at least the majority of you would have said, no, we can't read this trash to our kids. Your own code of conduct says that this is sexual harassment. We know it because all of us would be fired from our day jobs if we said this crap at work. This is the definition of a hostile work environment. My kids don't go to your crap schools, but theirs do, and they are filing these harassment suits on their behalf. Thank you for not doing your jobs. Brothers and sisters, this is America now. This is the sort of stuff I lose sleep over. How about you? Yeah. This is Virginia curriculum. This is not LA and San Francisco anymore. It's on the East Coast now. In the state where we have deep roots of the Constitution here. We've produced more presidents than any other state. And it's time for us to push back hard if we want a republic called the United States of America. The last thing that I'll cover before I talk about some solutions, a teacher was suspended for exercising his free speech rights, allegedly free speech. Out to an important story, a Loudoun County teacher on administrative leave tonight after saying that he would not affirm that a biological boy can be a girl and vice versa. Now his attorney tells us that they're considering legal action against the district. Fox 5's Josh Rosenthal is in Leesburg tonight with more. Guys, this is a Leesburg Elementary School where Tanner Cross is a physical education teacher, although right now his employment status is up in the air. All because of comments Cross made at this Loudoun County School Board meeting last week. I love all of my students, but I will never lie to them regardless of the consequences. I'm a teacher, but I serve God first, and I will not affirm that a biological boy can be a girl and vice versa because it's against my religion, it's lying to a child, it's abuse to a child, and it's sinning against our God. And controversy erupted from there. First, Cross was placed on paid administrative leave by the district. Clearly, it's tied to the fact that he made comments at a public meeting, public school board meeting, where they actually invited comments. Attorney Tyson Langhofer then sent this letter on Cross's behalf, demanding he get his job back immediately. That hasn't happened, and Langhofer now tells us a lawsuit could be coming next. Well, public schools can't retaliate against staff members simply for sharing their personal beliefs and ideas. The school board opened up a public forum where they were discussing important policy ideas that are going to, to impact both teachers and students. Others disagree with Cross. Teacher Robert Rigby represents the group FCPS Pride in neighboring Fairfax County. 
I would say God loves those children as the transgender children that they are. LCPS confirmed that Cross is on leave, although they wouldn't comment further. I was able to reach Cross tonight. However, he wasn't immediately available for comment. Guys. Now, fortunately, that lawsuit did go forth and he got his job back. But they're not going to stop. That was designed to throw fear in everyone else. Because even though you may win the lawsuit, if you're not blessed to have a law firm that will do it for you pro bono, it'll just break you financially, put you through a lot of emotional misery, so people aren't able to stand up. And so we'll get into solutions in just a minute, but I don't know if you noticed this, but this was the gay gentleman. Look what's hanging on his wall. You see the sickle? Brothers and sisters, we're having a Marxist revolution. This comes from Gallup and the Colson Center. One in six of our Gen Zers, those are born from those children that are born from 1996, 97 onwards to about 2012, are now identifying as LGBTQ. Here are the solutions. The solution obviously is to return to the scripture. Amen? And then to have a revival where our worldview is filtered through the precious Word of God, the inherent, infallible, God-breathed Scriptures that are profitable for doctrine, rebuke, correction, and teaching. And that once again become the foundation through the power of the Holy Spirit. What is biblical worldview? Biblical worldview is a set of beliefs, assumptions, or values based on the Bible that determines how a person lives. It's, it is your lens that you view everything through. And right now, we have half of the country viewing it through a Marxist lens, and we still have about half of us. It's actually church attendance, by the way, has fallen to 47%. Biblical worldview is a way to summarize the life-changing truths of Scripture with a laser focus on the gospel. Because as he thinks in his heart, that's what he becomes. That's what he is. Barna Research has found that a person's worldview is primarily shaped and is firmly in place by the time someone reaches the age of 13. It is refined through experience during the teen and early adult years, and then it is passed on to others during their adult life. But what worldview now is the predominant one, even in the church? I'll show you the stats in just a minute. Right now, only 4% of our Gen Zers have a biblical worldview. It's in the church as well. We failed them. And run, I'm not here to curse the darkness. I'm just saying, let's get together, repent, and ask God to move. And I believe in a merciful God who is full of grace and will help us do that. Amen. It's time for churches to elevate Bible study over entertainment of young people, for families to prioritize discipleship over athletics or academics. This is the sort of stuff that upsets people. When you tell them to prioritize a biblical worldview over sports, you're asking for trouble. Because Sunday sports are preferable now to church. If, the, if there's a conflict, they're going to pick sports. Many will. And what he's saying here is we are losing our children. I don't want to get into a debate on legalism and law. I just want to get into a debate on who loves Jesus. And I think we can agree on that one, can't we? Amen. Who's more important? And, and that's what he's saying here. There is a place for athletics. Kept me out of a lot of trouble, but back in those days, we wouldn't dare think of having a game on Sunday. We went to church. Amen. We had our games throughout the week and killed each other on the field and probably said things we shouldn't and then repented on Sunday, as if you shouldn't repent on Tuesday too. <laughs> And for Christian schools to prioritize maturity in Christ over college prep or academic rigor. So here are these stats. They're, they're fairly new. Gen Zers, they, only 4% have a biblical worldview. The millennials, those born 1981 to 96, only 6% in the U.S. now have a biblical worldview. The Gen Xers, 7%, and the Boomers, 10%. And as a result of the pandemic, the, the church was already closing its doors and losing members right and left, but the pandemic pushed it to the point where Barna says one in five, that's 20% of our churches may close never to reopen again it's because it's been weakened. I think the solutions have been pretty self-explanatory, but I just want to cover just a few things. 
We're going to have to get out of our comfort zones, mess up our own schedules, and start attending school board meetings and asking questions. Like they're doing in Loudoun County. What a great example. We're going to have to sacrifice and not leave it up to someone else. I was, <laughs> Pastor, I, this so helped me. The last time I heard the voices of the Lord so clear, I probably hear Him all the time, and I'm just too dumb to know it, and He's merciful and pushes me in the right direction. But there was, <laughs> I heard Him. I, when, when, I was out in San Diego and I caught COVID back before it was, you know, uh, declared a pandemic the next weekend it was. And I was back out there speaking at an education conference. But I came home and I was going through the airports and the cities were burning. Remember all that? And I remember I was walking up the steps in my house and I said this, when are the adults going to do something about this? And I heard the Lord say, you are the adult, do something about it. <laughs> oh. I haven't grown up yet. <laughs> and that's when, it's a long story, city elders came out of that and my relationship with Pastor Ray started to flourish and we said, okay, Lord, I'll do something about it. I don't know, I, it's too big for me. So he started networking some other, some other, it's been a great thing that God's doing. We need to carefully check all the children's curricula and then read it back to them. Now there are more options but then if you discover things from these board meetings and from the curriculum, send that, whatever you discover, to myself, to Pastor Ray, some of us who can aggregate this and get it out there on these radio shows and these podcasts and speaking engagements. But we need an army of people keeping an eye on, look, we're paying through our taxes for all this stuff and they're trying to hide it. And you got to say, look, I paid for it. I want it. Biblical Worldview, Renew a Nation, is an organization that helps people get started in Christian schools. In fact, when they first started, and they're still doing this, uh, I, my history goes back with them in the very beginning. They sent me on a speaking tour around Washington, D.C. The sole purpose is to just try to get Christian schools to teach a, a biblical worldview because they've stopped. I contacted Jeff today, the CEO and president of Renew Nation, and I just wanted to get my finger on the pulse of, of what's going on with the Christian schools across the country. Now, this is, this is you know, anecdotal. It's, it's qualitative, not quantitative. But I know some people, and he's, you know, this is probably the largest national organization we have here in America dealing with this. So I asked him this question today. I said, Jeff, on the national scene, how much of an increase in interest in Christian education are you seeing as a result of critical race theory and LGBTQ curriculum. And he said almost every school we're coming in contact with is growing. Not all, but almost all. Especially in areas where public schools shut down and Christian schools stayed open. Parents have been awakened big time. And Pastor Ray uh, heard this about Blue Ridge Christian School. I've spoken at Blue Ridge Christian School at least once or twice. Uh, that he's been told by a reliable source that they have had 215 new inquiries. That means people are getting concerned about this. My good friend, uh, Jeremy Woody is here. He's the principal over at Ridgeview. He's going to be on the screen here in just a moment. Um, he said something that would probably be uh, uh, similarly true of uh, Appalachian Christian School. Uh, there's been interest, but not so much. And, and I'll tell you what anecdotally I believe is happening. We still think, those of us that live out here in rural Virginia, that we're still insulated from this. Because the numbers show the closer you get to the big cities, the more interest there is. And what I'm here and what we're here to say is we better wake up because it's here now and it's coming. So I wanted Jeremy to speak to you. I, I filmed him earlier today. He'll be here to help answer questions a little bit later. If you want to hang around at our tables and so forth, we'd love to answer questions if we can, especially Jeremy about the school because they have quite a capacity. They can take kids. Um, but what do we do about it? Uh, is Christian educators. So here's Jeremy. Hi, my name is Jeremy Woody, and I'm the head of school here at Ridgeview Christian School in Stewart's Draft. I've been working here in the Valley and in, in, in this ministry in some form or fashion for the last 19 years. And what I can tell you is that a lot of things have changed and changed, especially very quickly here recently. One way to illustrate this is a story that I shared with a Bible class in our juniors, with our juniors and seniors here recently. I showed them a TikTok video that was online of a self-proclaimed gay reverend who was sharing why he loved the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7. He talked about how she, he had been asked to heal her daughter and that she had he had used a racial slur against her 
uh, and this woman spoke truth to power, according to this pastor, and and Jesus repented of his racism. And the reason why this man liked this story so much is because if Jesus was willing to do the work of repenting from his racism, then so should we. Now, the students' jaws dropped about probably as far as yours are right now with that story. First of all, we know that Jesus was not racist. Um, Jesus was the son of God, and Jesus uh, is holy. And so uh, it's an improper exegesis of that passage. But my other point to make to our students was that um, 19 years ago when I first started here, you had to work really hard to find somebody like this saying things like this, um, because just it, the access to him was very limited. But today, uh, we have ki kids who are scrolling around on TikTok, and this type of stuff is coming after them. What I, what I mean to tell you is that our enemy is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. And so I want to share with you just a few things that I see that are concerning right now. The first is just a non-realization or a fact, or not, we're not realizing the fact that discipleship is always happening. And frankly, our world is doing a much better job of it right now than we are. God gave us a great uh, plan for discipleship in Deuteronomy chapter 6. We said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts, mind, soul, and strength. Teach these things diligently to your children when you sit at the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. And you shall bind them as signs on, on doorposts and, and, and signs in your hands and even as frontlets on your eyes. And frankly, our world is, is, is doing that. What do our kids do when they rise? What do they do as they go to bed? What do they do when they sit around at the house? What do they do when they walk by the way? They're getting inundated by our culture and in ways that parents are just not even seeing that they're slipping under the radar, things that seem innocent. So discipleship is always happening and the world's doing a much better job of it. Secondly, dis discontentment is at an all-time high. The stats of, of suicide and depression and anxiety um, we have a world that is going through uh, so much right now, and yet they're being told that the solution is, hey, just turn to this, turn to this other identity, turn to this other sexual orientation. You, if you're afraid of being uh, accepted by somebody of the opposite sex, well, then just just try, try this. What they don't realize is this ache that they have within their heart, within their soul is actually an ache for God himself. St. Augustine once said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. But I think the thing that concerns me the most is that stats show us that the way to really help someone change um, is truth and relationships, that combination of both truth and relationships. And yet, in our culture today, those are both at all-time lows. Relationships are being torn down by a, for a number of reasons. We are distracted to death. It's a term that's being referred to as being alone together. People sitting around in a house, different rooms, staring at shiny rectangles, and, and yet they're lonely. But they don't even realize on the surface that they're lonely because they're just constantly being scrolled on to the next part of their social media or the next thing, uh, next TV show on Netflix. Secondly, truth is being deteriorated at a rapid pace. We used to say that, not that everybody ever was doing what was right, but at least there was some uh, agreement on the difference between right and wrong. We had moved from there into an era of time in which there seemed to be no right or wrong. And now we are quickly moving into an era in which what the Bible says is right, the world is saying is wrong. What the Bible is saying is wrong, the world is saying is right. There's a lot that we could say about this. We need to rally around families. We need to rally around our churches. We need to bring back the dinner table. We need to prioritize being involved in church. Now imagine all this going on and spending the majority of your day, five days a week, nine months out of the year, in an environment that is systematically removing all semblances of God and godliness out of the picture. We're so thankful for the godly teachers that continue to teach in our public schools, but is now getting to the point where they risk their jobs in order to just not live by lies and, and not condone a student's preferred pronouns. This all leads us to the dilemma that we are talking about here tonight. The good news is we have hope in Jesus. La laboring in our community. And what Jeremy was saying about the phones and, and all these things boils down to this. When they traced back these numbers and they did exhaustive studies 
and surveys on the biblical worldview, it all came back to social media. Every bit of it. Then there were studies done on cutting and self-harm. That he talked well, he talked about the suicide. That came back to social media. And then the suicide came back to social media. That's what I'm doing on the other thing that I do with that digital cocaine. So, in summary, we have two options. One, leave the kids in there and fight. I think we're very early into this. The better thing to do is to investigate the local homeschool, the local Christian schools, support them. I speak at uh, Ridgeview and at Grace. These are great schools. Um, and, 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 and then still fight the battle to get 1776 project back into the federal system, but that's going to be a long, drawn-out process. I'm not saying we give up on the public system. I'm just saying it's going to take a while, and every day that goes by, our kids are being discipled by Marxism. So at least in the interim, we find alternate sources. So the resources out there that are available, this is free. This is uh, Renew a Nation's latest magazine. They're out there. Take one. I wrote an article, A uh, Journey Toward Eye Balance, uh, for that one. But there's other things in there. My, my book, latest one, is available both in English and in Spanish. And there's a DVD that goes with it. The audio book is every single chapter read. It's, I don't know, six and a half hours. And then a, a section there on pornography. And then if you want to pull out your phones, it would be fine. I won't get mad at you. Here are some places that I recommend you visit regularly. And that's, these are uh, Pastor Ray's links. And we're collaborating on quite a bit of stuff, uh, as you already mentioned earlier. So if you want to take a photo of these and bookmark these and check them regularly. And when he comes up, I'll remind him to talk about the radio program. It comes on Sunday morning. What time? 9 o'clock on ESPN. And then if you want to take a picture of that, that's how you get in touch with me. Look, I don't want to leave you on a, a negative note. Do you believe that when the brethren dwell together in unity, God commands blessing? Can we continue to work together? We're very, very, very early into this. Pastor Ray and I are committed to getting, getting people like Jeremy together with the other principals and, and coming up with more and more solutions. Would you pray with us and labor with us for that awakening that Pastor talked about? Because that's what it's going to take. But I believe God will do it, don't you? I love the scripture that says from Acts chapter 3, verse 19. He says, To repent, therefore, and be converted. Why? That your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. God bless you guys. Thank you, Pastor Ray.